one of my favorite philosophers is um, Emmanuel Levinas, and he has this really beautiful quote that um, to look someone in the face is not an act of perception, it's, a, it's an act of ethics. And, and that's the, the philosophic nugget behind that kind of work that I do. Look someone in the face. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's City Talks representation. Tonight, our panelists will discuss the question, how should museums represent race? After a discussion, we hope you'll add your voice to the conversation during the Q&A. So the idea for this panel came out of a desire to talk about issues brought up by the process of selecting mannequins for made visible contemporary South African fashion and identity. So we wanted to take a minute to hear from Catherine Gunch, the department head and teal curator of African and Oceanic Art at the MFA, and the curator of this exhibition. Thank you, Deidre, for the introduction. Thank you to our panelists and our moderator, and thanks to all of you for coming this evening. So I know we do City Talks every month, and I asked my colleagues if they considered doing this particular talk, because while I was working on Made Visible, I knew we would include clothing, and I wanted to ask our textile conservators um, about mannequins. I think clothes look best on bodies, and so I wanted to talk about mannequins, and I asked how we've shown mannequins on uh, people of color before in the gallery. And I learned that at the MFA, we've never had a mannequin depicting a person of color. And so of course I asked, well, why? And they said, we're only able to use mannequins from about three companies that m use materials um, safe for our art objects. And in those three companies, there are quote unquote ethnic mannequins representing black people, all black people with one mannequin, Asians, all Asians with one mannequin, and Latinx people, all Latinx people with one mannequin. And so as you can imagine, those are very stereotyped looking mannequins. And so none of my colleagues have ever wanted to put a stereotyped looking mannequin in the galleries. So that individual decision makes sense and I could understand that as sort of an ethical position, but the cumulative effect means that we never have mannequins depicting people of color in this space. And so we've erased people of color from the galleries. When I was working on the Made Visible show, I was particularly interested in this issue of mannequins because the show in many ways deals with the legacies of apartheid. And apartheid was about erasing black bodies from the land that they owned, from the landscape, from cities, and from political power. On the other hand, the apartheid government forcibly cast black South Africans and put them on display for, the, for white visitors to museums. So I talked to all the artists in the show about this dilemma. You know, you don't want to erase people from the galleries. You also don't want to use these stereotyped mannequins that look nothing like South Africans and have their own problems and baggage. What do I do? And usually when you ask people, what do I do? They have very strong opinions. They're excited that you asked and they have a strong opinion. And in this conversation, the artists in the show, South African uh, professors, South African curators, um, people I talked to in Boston, Del was nice enough to chat with me about this this, this summer, all said, wow, I, I don't know. And so I proposed for this particular show, let's just ask the artists who either made the objects or artists who represent traditions from uh, the objects that are on display what they want. And so uh, Sophie Mishlangu and Esther Maguni chose our Endebele mount and their names are on that label to explain their choice or that they did make the choice. And Laduma Kolo told us that he wanted invisible mounts and so Laduma's works have invisible mounts. But I think that this issue is a symptom of the much bigger problem that we don't have representation of people of color in our galleries or on our staffs or boards or structures of power. And so I was looking forward to what all of you and all of you in the audience could share with us about this particular issue, but the broader context um, that gives rise to this kind of problem as we're making decisions. So thank you for coming, thanks to all of you, and I'll be sitting here taking a ton of notes. Thank you to everyone for joining us. I'm really excited and I feel really honored to be up here with um, some amazing women and um, we have, a lot to get to. Um, so the way it's going to go tonight, we're going to have a 30-minute panel discussion and then we're going to open it up to questions uh, after that. So I just want to start off with letting you all introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about your artistic and your academic practice, um, and how you explore issues of race and representation in cultural institutions in your individual practices. And Dr. Lewis, we can start with you. I'm at UMass Boston. I'm the director of the William Monroe Trotter Institute for the Study of African Diaspora History and Culture. Um, I'll say a little bit about William Monroe Trotter. 
Um, he was a journalist in Boston, journalist and activist, who fought uh, fiercely for the rights of all to be positively represented. Um, my uh, background in art, um, I have a doctorate in theater um, from um, City University of New York. Uh, I have a master's in creative, in um, translation. Um, and uh, my dissertation was on um, the lynched body um, in uh, theatrical representation. Um, I was also, in terms of what I do at the university, I try my hardest to make sure that um, our students uh, who come from a range of countries, it's, it's an extraordinary wealth at UMass Boston. We, we have students from um, various continents, various languages. Um, it's like walking through the, the United Nations, which I find uh, truly joyous and joyful. I enjoy hearing all those languages and listening to all those perspectives and ranges. I'll give you one example, which is certainly not um, the only um, representation I can think of, but we do have a, a limit of time. I remember being in the ca cafeteria maybe two years ago and there was a young man um, standing by me and I asked him where he was from and he said he was from, from France. His mother was Senegalese um, and uh, he had come to UMass Boston because he wanted to be, to be more fluent in English because his dream was to go back and be the mayor of Paris. So I was just excited by that. Um, in terms of my own um, artistic practice, I have to say that uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that I do have an artistic practice in addition to an academic practice. Um, I am a playwright um, and um, I'm absolutely thrilled by the context of history uh, and what, what history shows us and tells us and how at this moment and in other moments we seem to be caught in a sphere and cycle of history that's repeating. Um, and so in writing about history, I'm not also only writing about yesterday, I'm also writing about today. Um, in terms of um, the art practice that I have pursued most vigorously um, previously is that I have been a critic, um, a commentator, let me not say critic, a commentator. <laughs> um, I enjoy looking at art and seeing the many voices and faces and phases and phrases within it. Uh, so um, I was lucky enough because of my mother uh, to be um, educated in several languages. Um, and so it's that multilingual background of knowing French, knowing Latin, being fascinated by Spanish, Portuguese, German. I did some work uh, on, in the doctorate on German as well. And I found that the syntax of German was very close to the syntax of Latin, which I had loved. I loved conjugating and declining and doing declensions and all that stuff. So uh, yeah, I'm just thrilled by multiple perspectives. And I try to bring that sense of multiple perspective and that one language is not superior to another. There's an equality and an equation um, and also a richness that comes from looking at languages uh, in relation to one another. And that's all I'll say right now. Okay, thanks Dr. Yeah. Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi Amanda. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Got it. Um, yeah, so if you want to just give us an introduction to your own research um, sure. and how you explore issues of race and representation in cultural institutions. 
Absolutely. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Figueroa. Uh, I am a co-founder and the resource manager of a company called Brown Art Inc. We are a community incubator focused on uh, increasing arts ecosystem wherever we go. Uh, there's a lot in a very short sentence. Um, so I guess to break that down a little bit, uh, by community incubator, I mean that my business is interested in forging relationships between arts organizations and their hyper-local immediate communities. And by arts ecosystem, I mean we like to support um, local and early career stage artists by helping them build relationships with organizations and institutions that have career, career milestones and other resources to offer, like um, gallery space or maker space. Um, and then in my spare time, I'm also a PhD candidate at Harvard University, um, writing a dissertation that is about um, three-dimensional installation and sculpture by Latina and Chicana artists that responds to a significant amount of gender violence that happens in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, which is also my hometown. So those are my two main interests. Okay. Hi. Where do you want to start, Maria? I'm taking in. <laughs> what these two lovely ladies just shared with us. So tell us about your artistic practice. Right. Um, and I understand you have some slides for us. I do. Yeah. I do. I, God, I love PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so my name is Delmarie Hamilton. I'm a visual artist, um, independent curator, and a writer. I also have a day job at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. Um, I've been basically schooled by Harvard in the ways of representation and academic practice and visual art. Um, I feel really, really blessed to have that sort of as a kind of incubator network sort of research center to, um, to inform my practice. And I work across multiple mediums, so everything from performance art to painting to video, text art, installation art. So. Um, I will show you a few images of performances that I've done in and around Boston. Most of the themes are related to either personal memory, my family has roots in Belize and Honduras, as well as the Grand Cayman, and then certainly port cities here in Massachusetts, like Boston, but then New Orleans and New York. Um, but then also to sort of drawing upon questions around um, migration and citizenship and the body. And those become really interesting, at least for me, as we were talking a little bit earlier just about the fact that depending upon who I'm standing next to and the context, people talk to me in all kinds of different languages. Um, and these questions about the universality of a particular mannequin for a race, uh, such as African American or Asian or Latinx, I'm gonna jack that all up because I'm both, I'm all three of those things actually. Um, so yeah, so that makes this, these questions super interesting for me. Trouble My Water, Private and Public Actions in Self-Performance. So art is an investigation, a restless questioning, and a longing for answers. I had to sort of develop my own um, definition of art making. My undergrad's actually in journalism, um, and I have an MFA in visual art, but I had to figure out how to enter into this, the weight of art history, right, and sort of how that plays out over multiple generations. That's my studio. This is where the magic happens. But there you go, Francis Bacon. Bruce Dalman, I'm all good. The white guy's got it down. <laughs> On citizenship, the body, and history. Uh, sometimes I take my clothes off. Uh, these two images, uh, this one and that one, they're from a series I did in undergrad. Um, in undergrad, as a journalism student, you're doing everything from photography to graphic design and interviewing and writing on deadline. So for me, um, this was a way to think through these questions about what is art making, what is self-image, but also to the question of Du Bois's sort of famous quote around, you know, the problem, the, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, right? And he talks about double consciousness. So this doubling tends to show up a lot in my work. Uh, this is an image from a piece called Desire and Duchamp, which is a riff on Marcel Duchamp's new descending staircase. This is my first solo performance, about a year after um, grad school, going to the School of Museum of Fine Arts next door. So it's a two-hour performance that was here in the Lindy Family Gallery called Columbus Day Blues. A lot of my performances are roving through public spaces. 
um, bursting out into song, using my body against surfaces, placing myself in, in areas where there's lots of traffic. And this was a free day at the museum. It's kind of, it's empty here, but that particular day was like a swarm of people following me through this entire uh, family wing. This is a piece, durational piece, walking uh, 13 hours in um, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Again, Basquiat, Andy Warhol, again, trying to insert myself into that history of that's mostly dominated by men. Sort of marking my footsteps jumping for joy. This is a monument of George Washington right at the beginning of the Continental Army Plaza, which is at the beginning of the Williamsburg Bridge, which takes you into Brooklyn. So I circled that um, image or squared it more or less and then wrote and then drew my footsteps all around there. It's a piece called Blues Blank Black, which was supposed to be a one-time performance, but has now become a four or five-time performance, but riffing off of the work of Toni Morrison while repeating the names of black women who've um, been murdered, assassinated, died as a result of malfeasance or incompetence by police violence. Heavily influenced by the work of Toni Morrison, as well as folkloric figures from Central America, such as La Llorona and La Sucia. This is the most recent performance called This Is All We Have. I sort of morph, I use kind of a lot of props in my performances, but in this performance I morph from uh, Abraham Lincoln to Barack Obama to Donald Trump. Uh, this performance also too heavily invested in photography. That was sort of, photography sort of always at the root of my performance. It's really so much about image making and the hi history of photography. Thank you so much for sharing about your artistic practice and your academic practice. Um, so I want to start off um, talking about bodies in museums. Uh, and there's a lot to get to there. But I think first, uh, let's talk about um, the people who work in museums and what that looks like. Um, and the people who curate museums and educate in museums. Uh, there has been some research on that. The Andrew W. Mellon Foundation did you know, that big survey in 2015. It was updated last year, um, looking at the demographics um, in curatorial departments, education departments, um, and employees as a whole in museums. And there has been a slight increase, right? Museums are a little more diverse than they were three years ago. Um, in terms of educational, curatorial, and leadership uh, departments. Uh, I think three years ago, they were 80% white across the country. This year, they're 74% white. We are seeing um, an increase in hiring um, black curators and black educators, a slight, very slight increase in hiring for Latino curators and educators. Um, and we just know, like, Palpably, there is this um, very real push to diversify cultural institutions, right? I think cultural institutions recognize that if they want to stay relevant, that if they want to be tapped into the zeitgeist, that if they want to be resonant with the wider culture, um, they have to interact with it in authentic ways and thus um, be diverse. But I'm wondering if what these, what these slight increases, what they signal to you, I mean, do you see it as sustainable growth over time that can lead us on a path of cultural equity or or do you perceive it as part of a trend perhaps um, as many things are over history right we see waves I wonder what these numbers and these increases signal to you and I'd like to start with you Amanda Did I look like I had an opinion was it was it visible on my face a little bit <laughs> I, I do have an opinion. Um, what's interesting about this Mellon report and um, a similar one that was published in PLOS One recently is that, um, well, there's two things. One is that, that they look at diversity in terms of gender and race almost exclusively, right? There's no measurement yet of diversity of abilities, diversity of income backgrounds and things like that. Um, and the second to my mind is that when we consider these questions of diversity along racial lines, it's always in the context of whiteness. Um, that it's always saying like the variations of whiteness still the default. And so until that's the paradigm that shifts, a diversity initiative will get us only so far. Yeah. 
What, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Lewis? When I looked at the numbers, what jumped out for me was the, the paucity, the lack of black males in uh, those numbers. The numbers that are registered within that report, um, the increase in blackness, um, occurs primarily within or for African American women. And of course, I'm not against the hiring of African-American women, certainly not. But the, ver the much smaller numbers for black men uh, leads me to consider perhaps a harsh way of framing it, which is that the lynching tendency so present in our society um, is reflected within the way we do research. That the entity cut out, and I suppose I use cut out in very intentional ways, um, impacts most strongly the black male. And that's, that's painful for me. Um, it also talks about the desire to have within the included population those who cannot propagate alone. Uh, there's an element of not wanting reproduction or increase in the numbers inherent in that, uh, in the way it's framed and positioned and put forth. If I'm not mistaken, I think there was an increase of 3% um, hiring of um, African-American curators, and the majority of them were, were yeah, were black women. Um, so, yeah, I definitely, yeah, definitely see that. Um, I want to go back to this point that you made, Amanda, though, about how the how the way we talk about diversifying these these cultural institutions is usually with this framework of whiteness right as the foundational element but i wonder then how 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 are we cognizant of that while still recognizing that i mean like historically these are white spaces right and that we have to talk about that and be cognizant of that while also realizing that if, we, that if we talk about cultural institutions now as white spaces, it's almost an, er an erasure of the, people, of the people of color who are here doing vital work. So I wonder if you can sort of talk about how you sort of navigate language around that. And I wonder, Del, if you have any thoughts about that. The best way, at least for me, as I've come to understand some of these problems within institutions and also doing independent uh, curating is that it's a pipeline issue. And it's a similar thing within, particularly within African and African American studies. So it's, it's to the extent that I learned how to be a curator because I had mentors who were like, we need more people in the field. Uh, this is what you need to do. You've got the conceptual chops. You need to do this. It's, it's really a matter of urgency, to be quite frank. And so I think to turn it around, it's, it's more about these questions about, like, we're, start with the women of color. I'm always about, like, where are the women at? What are they up to? They have mad knowledge to share with us. And I'm, you know, I've been very fortunate in order to, and um, benefited from that. But it's a pipeline issue, and, the, and I say that because it actually has to probably start somewhere between like middle and high school. You have to actually really focus on getting kids into museums. I was one of those kids who cut school to come to this museum and to go to the Copley Library. I never conceived of, of it as a white space. That didn't even dawn on me. Um, it just wasn't something I cared about. I just really cared about the art and trying to think about how does art function and, and why images stay in my head. So for me, it's the kind of thing where it's a pipeline issue and you actually have to be intentional about building the pipeline and then you have to fund programming 
so that even in high school, students are getting training maybe in the summertime, paid internship training, working within museums. And then once they get out of grad school, then there's curatorial fellowships that get funded. You just need to create an entire ecosystem and a highway practically, or highways, in order to, to really remedy these situations. Um, so I want to talk about what we lose when there's a lack of diversity, particularly in curatorial departments. So I did a story recently um, where I interviewed Leila Bermeo. She's a curator here at the MFA, and she curated Frida Kahlo and Arte Popular, um, which is wildly popular right now, an exhibition here. And she spoke to me about how when she finished curating it, some of the cafe workers, um, some of the Spanish-speaking cafe workers who have been employed here at the museum for many, 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 many years, uh, told her that for the first time, they were going to go to a gallery and they were gonna go to her show. Because for the first time, there was a show that had sort of the cultural cadence that resonated with them, right? Like the show, the show's title was in Spanish and English, Frida Kahlo and Arte Popular. All of the signage, signage was on Spanish and English. They saw, um, they read about the exhibition in a Spanish uh, newspaper. And um, Leila, who's Mexican American and Colombian, um, became very emotional when she told me this because she's like, these are folks who, have, who are at the museum five days a week for more than a decade, and they've never been to a gallery. What is it about what we're doing that doesn't invite folks in, doesn't invite some folks in? And so that just made me think about like, what happens when we don't have the Leila Bermeos in the curatorial department? And so what, what do you all think that we lose when we don't have that diversity of voices curating? We lose a multiplicity of perspective. Um, we canonize one way of seeing. Um, it's a loss. We, it's an impoverishment of uh, the traditional and usual point of view. It, it loses a range. Um, I want to jump back to something that was said earlier, though that um, this idea of public space. Uh, for me, there's something problematic in defining the public as coming from just one perspective and not including different perspectives so that uh, there is a true richness. Um, I know I am I have a, um, a particular dimension in my view, but I feel that when just one cultural perspective or the dominant cultural perspective is not inflected by other perspectives, other ideas, other views, other visions, then that perspective is deeply limited. Um, I have another question, which I hope isn't depart departing too, too much from what you asked, but I did see the Frida Kahlo exhibit, and certainly I, I've, I've been to Mex Mexico City, and I've gone to the house where she and Diego lived, um, and we, we've all been uh, wonderfully exposed to the story of Frida Kahlo. But uh, I was here again, I think two weekends ago, uh, when there was a, a, a fire alarm and we were pushed out um, of the museum around closing time and we went out the, the other entrance and I looked back at the museum and saw the Frida Kahlo um, um, poster or um, the, the mounting. And I was so struck by the pain that was um, that could cannot be taken from her art 
Her art was um, created to a great extent out of pain and was about pain. And in seeing the exhibit recently, it was the first time that I really focused on the fact that she died before 50, uh, before the age of 50. But the idea of the pain that she went through, I, had, I questioned myself to what extent was that the frame through which her art is allowed the canonization that it is given. Do we have, um, it, it just seemed like pain kind of became her, her passage into canonization, and I'm very curious about that. Yeah, and I mean, I think that particularly with Frida Kahlo, you know, she's arguably um, the most famous painter um, in the Americas. And yet, she is not taught in a lot of um, art history courses. And she's usually spoken about in this kind of voyeuristic way, right? A, framed through her pain and through her affairs with women and through um, her tumultuous relationship with her husband instead of sort of like her artistry in and of itself. Um, but that's why I was actually so struck by Frida Kahlo and Arte Popular because it sort of strayed from that very tired, tropey narrative um, and it presented her through the lens of like her cultural and artistic lineage and her evolution as an artist um, that merited canonization without sort of like the voyeuristic titillating biographic details uh, that so often frame her. Um, but I think that was in part possible because of the curatorial lens of someone like Leila Bermeo um, who under, you know, who comes from a place and has sort of the authentic voice to, to curate this in a way that's resonant. Um, so, I actually want to segue now <laughs> to something different, uh, which is related to this. Um, you know, a few years ago when, actually I think it was last year, when the Brooklyn Museum hired um, a, a white curator for their African-American um, art department, there was a, a, big, a, a, a big conversation around, around what it meant like, not just to react to a decision like that, but to decolonize institutions. Uh, and sort of like the painful and uncomfortable conversations that you would have to have to sort of upend an entire system and decolonize it. And so I wonder what, what you all think of that conversation, what decolonizing institutions would look like to you. And I open the floor to anybody who would want to answer this. Well, my favorite thing to do at these panels is to get the microphone and then say something just completely polemic. Um, so this is my moment. Uh, <laughs> brace yourself. Um, actually, this is not all that controversial. This is just something uncomfortable, which is that uh, museums are, were invented to be tools of colonization. Museums were invented to display the might of empire by displaying the artifacts of other cultures. Uh, so that's not to say that, that decolonization is impossible. For me, I think that means that, that in essence, we would shift our focus from, from collections to programming would be my move, right? And here's the polemic part. I think we would just deaccession everything. No more collections. Oh my goodness. Give everything Ooh. back. Burn it. <laughs> oh. You, you weren't kidding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am here all week. <laughs> Del, I heard well, you say burn it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to own it. The reason why I say that is because it's actually really difficult for me to picture what decolonize this museum looks like. I really can't, I don't understand what that looks like simply because of the historical baggage of slavery and colonization. I mean, this is four or 500 gen, you know, years. I mean, I don't know, take your pick. It's a lot of time, right? But 
since I don't understand what my world would look like without the structures that are in place, what that leaves me with is not a lot of choices except to just burn it and deaccession everything and start from, from scratch. Now that's super scary because most of us are really resistant to change, right? Even trying to quit cigarettes. I haven't smoked in like years and yet last night I was like, I need a cigarette, right? But so the change part of it is, it, it, I'm not saying again, it's not possible, but I don't really know what it looks like to decolonize this this space. I, I, I truly don't. I don't have a, an answer besides deaccession and burn it. I, I mean, I mean, invent something new. And it can be done. I mean, jazz, hip hop, right? You know, pop art, whatever those things were in terms of an American context, right? So it can be done if you're willing to take those kinds of risks. But I would wager that most institutions and most even curators or teachers or, you know, even, you know, moms, like they're like, no, the, these paintings are pretty. Why do we need to give them back? I mean, it's just, you know, again, I think most of us can't really envision what that world looks like. Yeah. I mean, yeah. because it really, colonization and slavery rests on, and modernity itself, it, it rests on all of those structures. To be honest, we'd be out of business. We, we would have no livelihood if we decolonize this place. I mean, what are we gonna talk about? <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm being polemical for the, for the sake but of the, just- But, the, there, but there, there are degrees, right? Like there are, I just think the sort of like binary of either like burn it or, oh, it's, it's, it's an artifact of colonization. There's nothing you can do about it. In a way sort of leaves us powerless. Like, uh, like I think- You are powerless. I mean, you're not wrong. There's, there's no republic. <laughs> yeah, so, I'm sorry, Dr. Yeah, I'm, Lewis. I'm, I'm not in favor of burning it or getting rid of it. Um, I'm more on the side of decolonizing, contextualizing our perspectives, our insights, um, exploring the history, looking at the elements. I, I think rather than just, um, you know, throwing it all out, uh, it's important to understand how we got here. I, I want to know more rather than less. I, I don't want to walk away. I want to walk into. I want to walk into a larger story that has more perspectives. I'm grateful for Barbara's optimism and vision. Truthfully, I am. I truly am. Well, I, I think it's important, and it's not because, you know, I want to have a job or I want others to have a job. It's because this is the world that has been made for us. And we have participated in it and are participating in it. And I think it's incumbent. It's the, it's the mission of now to know more rather than to know less, to walk, walk face forward into what we have created and learn how we can create it um, a more nuanced tomorrow, a richer tomorrow, and a richer tomorrow in terms of knowledge and understanding and working together. So that's what's important to me, um, an, increase, an increase in um, going deeper into the history of how we got here and where we want to go from this place. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Um, so Amanda, I see you <laughs> sort of like holding onto your microphone, but I guess the last question before we go to the audience um, for questions is, I mean, if museums and cultural institutions are inherently a tool of colonization though, is there a, a reality in which radical change and radical reform is possible in these institutions. Oh, do I have to? <laughs> Anybody who <laughs> want to take that? Um, are you going to go? Please. Okay. Radical for me from, means from the root. Uh, that's the etymology of it, you know, coming out up from the bottom. Um, and I, I think it is time for radical change. I think radical change is indeed what we need to look at the roots of, uh, this is a continuation in a way of what I was just saying, to look at the roots of how this all happened. 
um, to look at, and as a historian who looks um, to a great extent through my university uh, perspective at the history of race in Boston, to recognize that the, um, the rocks on which we stand are the rocks of slavery, and what does that mean for us? That's, that's very important to acknowledge, that the wealth um, that Boston has, the wealth that this society, that this, um, yeah, that this society that was once a colony, and so the colonization, that the colonization requires uh, and demands diminishing, the diminishing of others. But maybe we are at a point now where that diminishing, perhaps because of the demographics, um, is not so easy to do. And we are called upon now to recognize that there is value in a very wide range of people and perspectives and understanding. And that, we, that now the focus is on multiplicity rather than, um, or multilingualism rather than monolingualism. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. So we're gonna open it up to audience questions. Good evening. Uh, I just, my question to the panel is, uh, would you look at the African American Museum and what Lonnie's done and, and, and the Schomburg as some beginnings of trying to identify with that? It took Lonnie, what, 10 years? That's what we know of. It probably took another 100 years to get to, to that point of where he is now curating something that is the history of his people. Uh, so I, I, when you were talking about that, it made me think more and more about that. It made me think about the Schomburg, even made me think about the Holocaust Museum in terms of some of the beginnings of being able to make that type of change. What would be your thought on that? The first thing that came to mind relative to the Schomburg is, again, the, the limiting of, of voices. Arturo Schomburg was uh, Puerto Rican. Um, he came from another language. He came from another culture. Um, he came to the colonial center to be able to do the work he felt was necessary to do. Um, and I, I still think that that kind of framing, that inclusion of different perspectives uh, without the dilution of heritage is where we are now and where we need to be. That there are just so many different voices, um, so many different voices of color. One of the things that was apparent and very strong for me when we went down uh, just... Um, a little while ago to look at um, the uh, Made Visible exhibit and we learned that um, there was just one face, one form that is allowed for all of blackness, uh, wherever that blackness comes from. For me, we are at a time where it's important to smash that, we that oneness or maybe that's a little too violent, to open up, to open up that oneness and be inclusive of the various voices, the various histories, and not do it in that kind of um, um, horizontal way, I'm thinking, you know, where there's, a, an there's evaluation of the, the image at the top, but that each of those images, each of those contributions, wherever they, wherever they happen on the ladder, are given equal valuation. I, I think that's our challenge now. And for me, that's what um, Arturo Schomburg represented, that uh, he brought the, the richness and wealth of his culture and his perspective into New York, into Harlem, but he lost something of his own history in that process, the way in which immigration, for example, people coming into um, Ellis Island, they, they lost, their names were truncated. One of the art managers at UMass Boston, um, he doesn't know what the family name is because when they got to El Ellis Island, there was a, a note on them that said, to Abe, that, you know, these people we're going to be meeting Abe. 
and so his last name now is Tuabe. So lots of names got truncated and histories got lost. If there's some way we can value those histories and value those names and value what we've come from, that's the position and the placement and the direction that I think it's important for us to go. So instead of reduction, multiplication and increase for me is the way to go. Hi, um, I've heard a lot of, um, I've heard the word reform a lot um, during this panel. And I, I wanna ask, um, how do you reform something that is so morally broken? Um, yes, I also like to say radical things. Um, how do you reform something that is a showcase of imperialism? Um, more so because I agree that we should give it all back to who it belongs to and burn this down. Um, but we should also like, have reparations for people who were affected by institutions like this. So how do you reform institutions that are so fundamentally morally bankrupt? I want to say first, I'm not the one who said burn it down. I think that was Maria. Um, I just said give it back. Um, that being said, uh, I work a lot with institutions as part of this relationship management work that my company does um, on issues of, of ugly institutional histories, right? Um, and one thing that I find over and over again is that when I walk into my meeting um, in these institutions, uh, museum staff at whatever level are saying the word reconciliation, reconciliation, we have to atone, and it's all this language of, of, of guilt and shame, perhaps rightfully, um, but also language that kind of presumes a, a, a available forgiveness on the part of a, a community somewhere outside the doors. Um, I like to carry my politics with me all the time, and so for me, I, I always like to gently correct. It's not reform, it's not atonement, it's not reconciliation, it's accountability. Um, it's reckoning, and, and if forgiveness happens, if forgiveness is able to happen, that's a nice bonus, uh, but that's not something you can presume. Um, and so for me, that's where it starts. Is it starts with an organization standing up and through a variety of means, which I would be happy to consult with you on, um, is able to at the very least say, we know where we come from. Hi. Um, yeah, so one thing I was really struck by listening to everything was um, this metaphor that Toni Morrison has for white supremacy. She calls white supremacy the fishbowl. And, you know, as, as a society, we describe, you know, what's happening in the fishbowl, what gets added to the fishbowl, what changes in the fishbowl. And the fishbowl itself is what contains and also constrains everything. And um, even the conversation here is very much a reflection of that. So talking about diversity, diversity is like putting different color jelly beans in the jelly bean jar. Um, the pipeline, like the pipeline assumes that there is a blockage that should not be there and somehow got there and all it needs, all that needs to happen is for it to be removed. In reality, there's been systemic blockages put in place. I wouldn't even call them blockages. So, and the idea of museums need to diversify to stay res relevant, it's like museums need to look at themselves and, and recognize in, in an accountable way that they have um, that they have operated in service of white supremacy by robbing <laughs> non-white cultures of their humanity. That's why museums need to do what they're doing. It's not to stay relevant. It's, it's for them to realize that they have plundered, stolen, lied to place themselves at the center always and, you know, talk about what does decolonization look like. Decolonization could look like, you know, 
instead of a big banner of Frida Kahlo out there, a big banner of an exhibition that tells the story of how the MFA acquired all of these things that are right behind us. Decolonization looks like you're asking, well, why don't the people who work here, why have they ever been here? You could put them in those chairs right there. Like you're asking a question about, about them. So instead of to them. So yeah, I'm just, I'm really struck by how even the language that we like can reach for to talk about this is reflecting uh, the world, as you said, that's been made for us. And that's, that's a white supremacist world. Thank you. Um, I, the structure that we're talking about, these are all private fiefdoms. They're private nonprofits. They have no accountability to, the, to us who is here or the people that work here. So, if it, so when you think about the only pu publicly held things that we have that are cultures are our public libraries and the Smithsonian's. That's it. So the first thing that I would like to see is that that changes, that they become publicly held so all of us have a stake, whether we work in the restaurant or here, on what happens. Until that, that, until that happens, it's not going to change. Until they're publicly held accountable on that level, and that's where I'd like to see it go, personally. Um, I just want to say there was a very beautiful commentary from the, the, the panelists and from the, uh, the, the general public that was able to make it out. Um, it was touched upon um, uh, the... Uh, I think you pretty much going towards like turning public, nationalizing um, uh, most of these spaces so that they can truly be, you know, uh, like we say what's going on here because that's a more direct form of representation. Um, because when I first saw the flyer for this, I gave my uh, comrade here some pushback. I said, uh, representation, isn't that just like when like Abercrombie and Fitch asked a black person to wear their clothes in front of their store? And just like, and like, they're just doing the same role that was being fulfilled by another person from before. Um, so, so I guess like, representation without real power, without self determination, is just a, um, is just a, a new mask, right? Um, I, I don't know if people are familiar, but I encourage you know um, Franz Fanon, right? He spoke a lot on this, like uh, you know, the the psychological part of colonization, you know, and how and how um, one of his books titled, it's a um, black skin, white mask, you know, like, uh, I'm sorry, black mask, white, white uh, you, you kind of get the picture. Um, it's, I, I know it's better in French, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. I think you're right, yeah. you're right. it's black skin, white mask. Yeah. yeah, oh, okay, cool. I got one point from no, the panel. Right. Okay, yeah, all right, cool. Uh, but um, so I'm just saying like, um, why we keep looking to insert ourselves into these spaces you know, and, and seeking some sort of, you know, recognition uh, from these uh, institutions that have existed so long on the backs of, you know, all these forms, all these colonial apparatus, you know, like, what, what's, what's the initiative um, that, you know, these, uh, like, these lovely, you know, white people who are trying to, you know, give us representation, what's the initiative for them to help us create our own spaces, right? I'm more interested, you know, in the, in a space, you know, like a library or like a cafe that shows art on a weekly basis as reflected by the community that lives here. Um, but then we also go into the talk about gentrification. Uh, there's that, that's important as well. Um, so like, w like, I just want to know what's the initiative for like art spaces for people of color so we don't have to constantly have to struggle, you know, to get recognized by MFA, to get recognized by Isabella Stewart Garner, to get recognized by you know, museums in New York City, because there's just not, like, we wouldn't be interested in it, you know, if, like, if, like, it wasn't the place to be, you know? Like, so, I guess, like, does anybody know anything like that? Oh, there, there is a group in Boston working on that, specifically on creating, um, like, a, a black-owned space supported by the city. They, they made it to the final round of a request for proposals for an art space, or for a space uh, for public use in the seaport, uh, and they're called C3, and I always forget what the three C's are for. Um, you know, the, it's like something community collaborative, uh, but you can Google it, and um, uh, let's see, uh, Mich um, Lamarchi Frazier. Melissa Alexis, Lamarchi Frazier, Alensa Michelle, I think her last name is. Um, I think Ashley Gordon. Ashley Gordon, Daniel, um, 
ooh, Daniel Callahan and some others put this together. So it's a nascent organization that you should Google and look up, but that's exactly their point about kind of making black-owned space within city-owned um, city -owned spaces that are being offered to the public so that they do have that control and so uh, they can kind of curate and decide what audiences want from this particular perspective. And I think it's a really, we wrote a letter of support for their bid um, to the RFP to the city and unfortunately they made it to the final round but they didn't win. Uh, but I hope that they'll, they'll try again with the next opportunity to the city. I would also add there are um, a, like a groundswell of local art art for people of color, artists of color spaces. Um, that is my main interest, that is what I love, the hyper-local, the emerging artists of color. Um, but that being said, I just wanted to go back to a, uh, a question that Maria posed earlier tonight, which was about what do we lose when we lose um, people of color in institutions like this? And what you lose is the, the history that a place like this has been occupied by people of color for a lot longer than we might think of, not in the numbers it should have been, not with the um, uh, uh, accountability, not with the recognition that it deserved. But there have been people here, and when we, when we let them filter out, when the, the pipeline breaks down, we lose that sense of continuity and ownership. And that's important to me also. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. I'm Kelly Chun. I'm on the board of the Roxbury Cultural District. And if the former representative Byron Rushing was here, he would tell you that the museum is actually technically located in the neighborhood of Roxbury. But that's another discussion for another time. I have a question But thank you for, for that footnote, yeah, yeah. Kelly. I have a, a question for anyone on the panel, but especially Amanda. Uh, you being a consultant and doing uh, what you do, how do you advise institutions when you go in and you engage in a self-reflection exercise what are some of the ways that you recommend that they hold themselves accountable? The work that I do is um, always tailored to the space that we're working in. That is so important to myself, that is so impor important to my business partner who I work closely with. Um, so I can give you some broad strokes here, but, uh, but ask me on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, when I'm thinking about institutional accountability, for me the most important thing is face-to-face. Um, -face. Uh, I think you need to open your doors. I think you need to, to get people in, and I think you need to look them in the eyes as you say, this thing is kind of messed up, and we don't love that about us, but here we are. Um, and to be using that FaceTime to take account from your, from your local stakeholders, what do they want? There's never gonna be uh, the same response institution to institution, community to community. So the best advice I can always give is, um, don't ask me, ask the people who, who are next door to you. Uh, to get super philosophical, I guess, here in the end, um, one of my favorite philosophers is um, Emmanuel Levinas, and he has this really beautiful quote that um, to look someone in the face is not an act of perception, it's, a, it's an act of ethics. And, and that's the, the philosophic nugget behind that kind of work that I do. Look someone in the face. I guess it's a wrap.